On this episode of What's Going On with Shipping, we get an update on the motor vessel Dolly and look at who's going to pay for all of this mess. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So we're going to do a quick little update, give you where we're at on this March 31st of 2024 regarding the motor vessel Dolly and the salvage efforts that are underway. And then we're going to talk about the issue of marine insurance. That's right, marine insurance. If you want a great video, one guaranteed to grab a lot of views, then talk about marine insurance. <laughs> no. This is going to be really terrible, but you have to understand marine insurance to understand where the liability is and who you can actually sue in this case, because if you believe it or not, it's really, really interesting. And it's one of the reasons I love talking about the maritime sector. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell to so be alerted about new videos as they come out. So a couple of quick updates. Number one, there is a site that you can go to now, Key Bridge Response 2024. This is the site of the um, uh, unified command that has been put in place. Remember the video we did talking about who's in charge? Well, still not quite 100% sure we have that clearly defined yet. The captain of the port, that is the senior Coast Guard commander, has been designated as the incident commander. However, we have three different salvage operations that are going on here at the same time. Number one, we have the ship. This is what's going to be done by Resolve Marine. We have the salvage going on between the navigable channel. This is the main structure of the bridge right here that you're seeing. That is being done by Don John. That's for the Army Corps of Engineers. That's from Navy Soup Salvage. It's for the Coast Guard. And then you have Maryland Department of Transportation. That's dealing with the rest of the bridge that's outside the navigable parts all the way to the main area. So all of this has got to be coordinated. And what we're seeing taking place right now is efforts to do that. We're seeing, for example, a lot of cranes are moving into the area, the Chesapeake 1000, Weeks 533 crane. These are big, huge, massive 1,500 ton cranes that can come in and start removing objects out of the water. We are also concerned about the ship. The crew of the ship is still on board the dolly. You will not remove the crew because it is a functioning vessel. You need power on the vessel. The ship has to remain stationary. That may involve the ship using its propulsion systems to maintain its, uh, its location. But more importantly, once the ship is freed and ready to move off, they may need the ship's engine to assist in pulling off. Remember, the bow of the vessel up forward is currently aground. Now, we're not sure if it's run aground up onto the piling here or if it's because it has a bridge stretched across it. They are starting to remove some of the big superstructure of the bridge. They're trying to get weight off the bridge. Uh, so they're going to try to remove the top hamper, the, the, the kind of the lattices of the bridge. This will ease the removal of the bridge if they have to drag it out of the channels. But most of this cutting was being done in the sections outside the main navigation channel. They are not in there at the vessel yet because vessel stabilization is still going on. Reports have it that two of the forward compartments have flooded in the vessel. And then you're seeing barges coming. You're going to need barges to offload this material from the that the uh, welders are cutting. It's got to be attached to cranes, hoisted over, and then that salvaged steel will go over to over to the area that is the old Sparrows Point uh, shipyard down there. That is a recycling area for uh, the material. So I'm going to clarify something in, in the video I just did on the TikTok that was released by the NTSB that did the kind of the timeline that we just did. So understand something about ships, and I apologize if I didn't explain this clearly, but I, I sailed for a while and sometimes I forget how much I got to explain. So one of the things I do love is please comment. If there's something I'm not clear about, please comment. I apologize for not responding to every comment, but th there are a lot <laughs> and I've been trying to get to everyone. So two things that happen in the video of the ship. One of the things that happens is you see the ship go completely dark. That should not happen for a variety of reasons. So this is a generic plan. This is not the engine room of the dolly. I, I don't have that specifics. But this is a, a fairly typical uh, container ship engine room. So you have the main engine right here. This is the big, huge, massive diesel engine. If you look at that video from Chief McCoy, that's the big engine that they're starting. This is the engine that's directly connected, probably in the case of the dolly, to the propeller. So that when the engine spins, it spins the propeller. When the engine stops, the engine stops. That does not provide the electric lights and power for the vessel. Now, there's a generator when the ship is at sea that is hooked 
up to the propeller shaft that will get its power from that so that the main engine can generate electric electricity it's kind of a takeoff generator that is used but you would not use that in port because the propeller is spinning at different speeds and that's a big problem with an electrical generator instead what you tend to have are these what are called ship service diesel generators so kind of like the video you saw from eric barton there the steam guy who had was showing you the emergency generator there are larger versions of those uh big huge diesel generators that provide the electricity the lights the power for the vessel that's what what they do so you have the diesel generators that provide power you have the large slow speed diesel that provides propulsion to the ship now what we saw was power go out and the ship lost control and so the question becomes did the ship lose its main propulsion we think so because we saw that big huge plume of black smoke come out that was either them trying to get the main engine back online or them trying to potentially stop the engine and back it down but what we do know is they lost lights and power which means that these diesel generators went out they should be a series of them running not one not two but two or three of them running uh, there will be multiple distribution panels so that what happened on this ship was an electrical or a computer issue is what i think that's what we tend to think. That would explain why you have this control room up here where you overlook the whole system. That's shown in Chief McCoy's video there at the very beginning. They're in the control room where they're turning on diesel generators. They have the main uh, panel there for the ship's engine. And what happened was they lost power and then they lost control. So that's one of the things we think happened on board. And that's what we want NTSB to come back with and let us know. What, and what was the cause of that loss of power? Was it bad fuel? Was it an electrical issue? Was it a control issue, a computer issue? A lot of people are talking about hacking into this. Let me be clear. You've never been on a ship if you think a ship is going to be hacked into. These things are not uplinked in the satellite. Now, it can be hacked, but you physically have to go in there and, and basically upload via thumb drive, computer, into the control system the issue. Uh, you're not going to sit there with a satellite and, 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 and hack it. You're certainly not going to do it with the rudder let me be clear uh, you, you, a lot of ships are really analog in some features uh, yeah we have a lot of high-tech stuff on board but there's a lot of it is still very physical person turning gear knobs type stuff so the next update i want to give you was an issue that happened the other day where they actually stop work on the dolly i'm going to be referencing a site called gcaptain.com gcaptain is a great maritime site i contribute to them uh john conrad the ceo has been on my show many times matter of fact i had him on for that live q a if you really want to get the most up-to-date information all the time you can of course go to the unified command but they're going to be slow gcaptain is great they will have this and they're really doing this they got a newsletter you can follow there's a whole batch of things you can follow but a couple of quick notes here number one notice the weather here uh this is the problem going to be in baltimore the other morning they had very heavy fog come in, and it gets choppy at times in the Chesapeake Bay. I've sailed in the Chesapeake Bay many times, and the wind will come up. Uh, it's one of the reasons why people love to go sailing, literally sailboats out there, is because of the wind. That's going to be a problem. We saw that during the uh, salvage of Everforward two years ago. But the big issue that happened was this. A high-pressure gas pipeline halts the salvage of the MV Dolly. So what do I mean by this? Well, the Dolly, this is the chart here. This is from Marine Traffic. If you want to follow how ships move around the world, there are several AIS, automated information system, systems that are out there, or identification systems that are out there that you can use. I like marine traffic. Uh, I use it all the time. This is Dolly here. And one of the things you'll notice is this is the bridge. Obviously, the bridge is, is, is down at this point. The white here is the main channel. Depth here is in meters. So 15.1 meters in here. They're in around anywhere from 10 to 9 meters of water. But the thing I want to highlight here is this line right here, this purple line with the dots and dashes squiggle right here. That is a gas pipeline. And it is believed that the bow of the ship is being pushed down by the bridge on top of it. And the bow may be encumbering that gas pipeline. So there has got to be a survey to determine whether or not there's been a fracture or damage to the gas pipeline. On the back side are electrical lines. Now, the electrical lines have been moved. If you look at this image here, you'll see these big towers. The electrical lines are now up in the air over. However, there are older electrical 
electrical lines that are underground. I don't know if they're powered or not, but we know they're there. There's also a water pipeline that's in this area. So what we have is the bow and stern of Dolly may be encumbering them. Now, the stern of Dolly should be afloat. It should be in deep water. This is part of the marine survey that's going on. So it's not just a matter of pulling this vessel back. If you yank this vessel back right now, if it's sitting on that gas pipeline, that may cause damage, even though the pipeline may not be damaged now. If you drag across it, that may be a problem. It's one of the reasons why you need to get the bridge off the dolly. And that's going to take some time to get it off. You don't want it to fall further, damage the vessel further. The hazmat operation is underway to clean the haz hazardous material. All right, let's talk about the insurance implica implications and what's going on. So one of the first things to notice is because the Port of Baltimore is closed, ocean shippers have declared force majeure or an act of superior force has been executed. What force majeure means, basically it's an act of God, is that the ocean carriers that were originally slated to deliver their cargo to Baltimore are now going to drop off their containers wherever they want. That's right. With force majeure, they have that right. It's not just a matter. Now, hopefully your ocean carrier, if you got cargo booked, and your freight forwarder can arrange to have your cargo delivered somewhere else. But because Baltimore is now inaccessible, they don't have to leave the containers on board. So they're going to get them off. And hopefully it's close to you. They can literally drop them off anywhere. But this is a part of global shipping. They don't have to carry around your containers. It is up to you to make the arrangements to get your cargo to where it goes. And understand, if you think that's the worst thing you've heard so far, hang on. It's going to get a lot worse than this. It was only a matter of time till somebody brings up Titanic, and here we have this story. Titanic-era law could cap ship owner liability in Baltimore. The owner of the ship that rammed into a Baltimore bridge could face hundreds of millions of dollars in damage claims after the accident and send vehicles plunging into water through the eastern seaboard network into chaos. What they're talking about here was an 1851 law called limited Limitation on Liability. So one of the things that happens is that Ocean shipping has always been a, a factor, and loss of cargo, loss of ships has been a common feature. And one of the things that was going to prevent ocean carriers from going out of business was should a ship be sunk, the amount of damage you can sue for the ship owner for was the amount of the value of the shipping cargo after the voyage. If the ship was sunk, there's no value. So therefore, you had no damages. So for example, when Titanic sank and people wanted to sue White Star Line for the loss of the vessel, cargo, loved ones, everybody like that, there's no value because the cargo had not been delivered. That's right. Limitation on liability limits the liability of not the person shipping the cargo, but the ship owner for doing this. And let's be clear, the ship owner here is a very interesting case and it's really important to understand this. So before we tackle the insurance, you need to understand how ships are owned and structured because it's, it's not the same as we are used to dealing with in the outside world, at least on land. So ships typically will have three layers to them. And so right here, I pulled this from Equus, which is a database. You'll see here the ship manager, what is called the ISM manager, and then you'll see the uh, registered owner. So in the case of the registered owner, that is a group called Grace Ocean PTE Limited out of Singapore. That is a corporation that physically owns the ship. That owns the vessel. Now, that company right there is owned by a Japanese individual, but it is not unusual in shipping for ships to be owned by their own individual company. And the reason for that is liability. Uh, we learned this from Exxon Valdez. Exxon found out it was a really bad idea to have their name on the side, but more importantly, to physically own the ship because it exposed all their corporation to liability. And so what we do is we see ships isolated into these little pockets of corporations. Then in turn, you have what are known as the ISM, the ship independent, uh, the independent ship manager who basically operates the vessel. In this case, it's Synergy Marine out of Singapore. Synergy Marine takes care of getting basically the crew on board, husbanding the ship, fueling the ship, basically operating the vessel. But it doesn't get the cargo. There's someone else involved here, and that is Maersk Lines. Maersk, the big Danish firm, is who this ship is operating for. So the owner gets a 
company to operate the vessel, the operating company then gets a contract to go work, and in this case, it's with Maersk. This sounds very confusing, but in truth, you see it all the time. It's the guy who delivers cargo to your, or, or delivers packages to your house during the holiday season from Amazon, except he drives up in a white transit rental van. That's the same thing. He works for Amazon. Amazon's the big parent company. He himself contracts with Amazon, but as an independent uh, agent, and then he gets the rental car or the, the transit van from a rental company because he doesn't own a transit van. Same exact thing. Now, take the scenario. He drives up to your house and knocks over a bridge in your front yard. I don't know why you would have a bridge in your front yard, but let's assume you have a lot of money and you have a big honking bridge in your front yard. And he comes up and boom, knocks down your bridge. Who do you sue? Do you sue Amazon? Do you sue the driver? Or do you sue the rental company in which he gets the truck from? If your answer was, well, I'm going to sue Amazon and I'm going to sue the driver, that probably is smart. That's exactly what you, what you want to do. However, in marine insurance, you sue the truck. You sue the owner of the truck. That is the person who gets sued in this case. And that's what you're going to see here in these maritime liability cases as we go forward. Uh, and if you have a bridge in your front yard, uh, you should really support this page. I think if you can afford a bridge, you should be supporting the page. I'm just saying. All right, let's look at the claims here. So this story, insurers face billions in losses from Baltimore bridge claims. Let me be clear. If I'm a ship owner, one of the 11 ships stuck inside Baltimore Harbor, I'm suing right now. I am losing wages. I'm losing business. I am suing. If I'm a ship outside of Baltimore waiting to come in and now I have to divert, I have to offload cargo anywhere, or if I'm delayed, I'm suing. If my cargo is on a ship that's due into Baltimore and now that cargo is going to get offloaded in Galveston, Texas, and I got to truck it all the way from Galveston up to Baltimore, I'm suing. The amount of liability here is going to become astronomical. That's not even including the salvage costs, the replacement of the bridge, the loss of lives. The, the, understand, we are still dealing with the fallouts from Ever Given in the Suez three years ago. So we're talking about billions here. If you go on with this, you start seeing even more of that. This could become the costliest maritime accident in history. If a ship sinks, that's straightforward. That's easy. That's an exact number you can come up with. When MOL Comfort, a container ship, broke up in 2013, cracked in half, that was a quarter of a billion dollars in, in liability that was paid out. It gets worse when the amount of liability is unknown. When Ever Given got stuck in the Suez and it made 450 ships late, that was untold liability. That's going to be the case here in Baltimore. And then we start seeing these numbers. Baltimore Bridge, $2 billion rebuild starts with clearing the ship. There's going to be a number you're going to keep hearing a lot of, and it's going to be right around the 2 to $3 billion mark. And I'm going to tell you exactly why you're going to hear that number over and over again as we go on. The other phrase you're going to hear is general average. Let's assume you're in an Uber or some sort of a Lyft or whatever share ride that you want. And the share ride driver gets into an accident and the car is damaged. Well, his insurance should cover that. Uh, but what if the insurance company then comes after you, the consumer, which sounds strange. It's like, why would the insurance company come after me? I was just riding in the back of the Uber. Well, in maritime insurance, that ship wouldn't be sailing that route unless the cargo was on board. And therefore, the cargo should share in the salvage of the vessel. Now, this goes back in ancient custom where at times ships were in danger of sinking you had a jettison cargo so that it wasn't just the goods that were tossed overboard that lost everybody shared in the loss so the damage was spread across all the cargo so even if your cargo was on board you would share in the salvage cost to save the vessel just like the person who lost their cargo would same thing happens here in marine insurance now let's be clear General average refers to the salvage of the ship. It doesn't deal with the bridge. It doesn't deal with the loss of life on the bridge. It deals with the salvage of the vessel. So that if the insurance company for the vessel decides that they want to declare general average, then all those who have cargo on board based on value would have to share in the cost of the salvage of the vessel because the ship wouldn't be there unless it was hauling cargo. I know this sounds arcane, this sounds horrible, but welcome to Maritime Law. 
So this video comes from the International Group of P&I Clubs. I know it sounds like a fantastic club that you want to join. P&I is Protection and Indemnity. The International Group of P&I Clubs is 12 clubs around the world that largely provide the bulk, almost I think it's about 80 or 90 percent, of the world's insurance for ships cargo at sea. The, the one in particular we're looking at here is Britannia P&I. Britannia P&I is the company that is insuring the cargo on board the Dolly. Now, if you are shipping cargo, you should have uh, general average and insurance for your cargo. Now, this is not always provided. Most people who ship usually should go through a freight forwarder or what's called an NVOC, a non-vessel owner, a common carrier who can basically book cargo, but they should get the insurance for what we're going to talk about here. So these 12 clubs do the bulk of the insuring. This process, by the way, is what's being used right now to prevent Russian oil from being shipped at over the price cap. These clubs right here are basically told by the G7 and the EU not to give insurance to ships if they're hauling Russian oil. Now, Britannia is on the hook for the insurance claim that's going to come out of this accident. But understand, it's not Britannia alone. So there are three levels of P&I insurance. The first level of P&I insurance is provided by Britannia. And this, this video is very weird that it, it actually gets it right here. It shows you this uh, elision here that happens between a ship and, and a, uh, uh, a pier, in this case, a bridge. So the first level is provided by, P and, by Britannia. That's up to $10 million. Then the second level, up to $100 million, is provided by pooling together the resources from the club. And the club will take us into that second level. And then beyond the second level, and the idea here is to spread out the, the insurance so that not one club gets knocked out here, so they get it. The third involves something called reinsurance, where the companies will have insurance on their insurance. And the third level is this collective purpose, uh, purchase of high levels of reinsurance. And this goes up to an amazingly high level. Okay, so I will have the link to the video. You can watch the entire video in the site here so you can take a look at it. P&I clubs are in this kind of pool together and then they have this collective reinsurance. It's provided by an organization called Hydra Insurance, Insurance Company. Hydra, really, seriously. They watched one too many Marvel movies here. So the 12 clubs are organized in this, and the way it works is you have these staggered levels and layers that are involved here. So as I mentioned, the pool will cover kind of the first 100 million. That's, that's 10 to what you see. Uh, the P&I Club will cover that first 10 million, and the rest will come in and pool their resources together. Now, the reason they could do this is that they're reaping insurance you know, claims, and, or, or I should say uh, uh, fees from companies from all around the world. So the money is coming in, and, and this is the big thing I'm going to talk about at the end, is how this may actually cost the world some money here. So you're up to 100 million here in the first pool. And then you have another 650 million. This is provided by the beginning layer of the pool. This is that reinsurance will take you up to the $750 million layer. Then there's another layer on top of that. This is 750 million on the 750 million. There's another layer of insurance on top. It takes you to 1.5. Then there's another 600 million on top of that. And the final layer, which is the collective on top of it, takes you up and above with an additional billion dollars. All told, reinsurance provides up to $3 billion of coverage over the original $100 million provided by the P&I clubs. This is insurance upon insurance. And the way this works is that the insurance clubs are raising insurance money from all their collectives. Now, let's be clear. A lot of money is coming in right now. Shipping, believe it or not, is safer than ever before. I know it doesn't seem that way. We've just had a, a ship fire on board, a U.S. vessel that sailed out of, uh, out of Alabama. We just had uh, a, a collision of a barge versus a, a pier or, excuse me, a bridge in, on the Arkansas River in Oklahoma. But believe it or not, shipping is very, very safe. And as matter of fact, the insurance companies are making money hand over fist, largely because they're collecting more risk insurance due to the Houthi, and the Houthi are not inflicting as much damage as the war risk insurance that's coming in. So insurance companies are flush with money.
But they have coverage up to $3.1 billion that's provided. It's one of the reasons why you will keep hearing the number of 2 to $3 billion as is because this is about the max that you're going to see come out of these marine insurance companies. Now, let me be clear. I am not an attorney. I just study maritime admiralty law a lot. I am hoping to get somebody on, Allison Cusack, the shipping, uh, shipping lawyer. She's really good, and she can break this down even further for us. But this gives you an idea of the claims that goes. This is going to be the claims here on the P&I Club that would go toward building the bridge. So you heard President Biden talk about the fact that he is going to allocate money to rebuild the bridge. However, there the bridge is insured. Chubb, uh, C-H-U-B-B, has the insurance on the bridge. Uh, they will be f- going after the ship, the owner, uh, all of this, more importantly, the P&I Club, the insurance company, to get the money to rebuild the bridge because there's going to be costs associated here. So don't think for a minute right now that this is just the United States footing the bill for the bridge. We are putting money up front right now to start the process, to get the uh, salvage equipment on scene, to get the ship off, to really start the process of building. But you can expect that Chubb, uh, the Department of uh, Transportation from Maryland, and everybody else who's gonna be outlaying money here to do this are going to be going after the insurance. And this is why marine insurance is really important. It is the bread and butter that makes shipping go round. The reason ships aren't going through the Red Sea right now is not because of the Houthi attacks. It kind of is, but not exactly. It's because the Houthi attacks, they're not worried about the Houthi attacks inflicting damage because the Houthis don't hit that many ships and, and they don't quite know what they're hitting at at times. What's stopping ships from going through the Red Sea right now is the high insurance costs. That's what's sending them around Africa, and you have to understand insurance to understand shipping. I hope you enjoyed today's update. I know it was a lot. I apologize, but there's a lot going on here. If you enjoyed today's episode, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? Well, you can hit that super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon where you become a monthly or yearly subscriber. Until our next video, Sal, signing off.